here today with Scott Finley of Parks Canada. Scott, can you give me your official title, please? Uh, I'm in charge of uh, corporate events. What actually preceded the battle? Uh, that, that's that's really important to, to start with the Battle of of, uh, of York, uh, which of course was the uh, was the capital at that point that had moved from Newark. The parliamentary buildings were there. Uh, there was a, a sizable uh, British presence there at Fort York. And um, of course, the Americans saw this as a great opportunity to just swipe in there, you know, and, and close everything down essentially and, and use that as a, as a footbed. Also, I believe. Uh, there was a lot of shipbuilding going on there too, and and we don't talk about that probably as much as we should. Just this whole conflict that takes place on the Great Lakes, where you know whether you know if you dominated Lake Erie or if you dominate Lake Ontario, it had huge ramifications for any fortifications that were 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 around there. So about uh, about a month before uh, the Battle of, of Fort George, the Battle of York takes place. Um, the Americans basically overrun uh, the town. Um, Schaaf, who's in charge, uh, decides it's probably best that they remove the men and get them up to Kingston. Um, and to some extent, he's pilloried even to this day for that decision. Um, he's he's standing in a in the middle of a very big shadow of Brock, who had just died that that fall before, and. Uh, I think everybody judged any general after that point by how Brock-like they were. And, and and there's a lot of people that don't feel he was that Brock-like at all. Um, but uh, the Americans moved in. Uh, they uh, disrupted all the shipbuilding that was going on there. Um, they, uh, as I say, burnt the Parliament buildings, which was, a, a, I think it was just like a long, long building. They uh, they found the, uh, the Speaker of the House's uh, wig, and declared that it was the British atrocity of scalping some American somewhere and putting it on there. They took that out. They, and then, uh, then they came en masse. Uh, one of the things that uh, the British did do as they were retreating, though, is they fired their own magazine. So in other words, uh, Fort, Fort George has a magazine, of course. It's that wonderful brick or stone building at the back of the fort here. Um, there was a sizable one at Fort York as well. And so a magazine, you mag know. magazine is where they kept all the powder and the shot and, and everything they needed for blowing up things, essentially. So when that thing blows up, it is a huge explosion. Um, Zebulon Pike who's uh, in charge of the invasion, right? He's about a mile away from that, interrogating a British prisoner that he's caught. And he's crushed to death by falling debris from this magazine going off. And uh, they said even in town here, in, in what was Newark, of course, they said the people living here, their windows rattled with the, the pressure of that, that happening. So, um, so that was kind of how they mopped up there. Uh, that that freed the American army essentially to go wherever they wanted to and where they headed to of course you can still see in the distance there it is Fort Niagara originally a French fort uh, then the British fort and uh, now of course in the American hands thanks to Jay's treaty after uh, after the Revolutionary War and um, it he, he brings them all there uh, to, to kind of plot his plans. I think Dearborn sees this as the opportunity they've been looking for. If you think about that first year of the war beforehand, uh, they, they really took a licking in, in a lot of areas, uh, you know, uh, whether it was out west um, or, or northwest up in, uh, in uh, off of Lake Huron or, or you know, uh, certainly at Queenston Heights, you know, they, they really did uh, take a licking. So what's uh, the date that we're looking at here? Uh, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it would be, uh, it'd be the spring of 1813. Um, so if you, if you lived in town, you knew something was up. When they started moving, of course, uh, the army over to this side, we're talking about, see, and I, it, I like to throw a figure, but I've seen everything from 4,000 to 7,000 American soldiers were kind of bivouacked on the other side of the uh, of the fort, and uh, as a, a compatriot of mine likes to say that the 
uh, the, the one of the quotes he read was, you, you could tell the American armies there because when they woke up in the morning, it was one sustained cough, you know? And uh, so they're, they're very nicely positioned. Uh, they, get, they get behind the fortifications <clears throat> and it allows Dearborn to, uh, to uh, strike up his plan. And initially, when he does that, everyone kind of second guesses them. They're thinking, well, they're going to do a direct assault from Fort Niagara right across the river and, and you know, kind of dominate this part of the river. And uh, he comes up with uh, an alternative plan, and that is not to attack directly across, but rather to go uh, out in the lake about uh, a mile down on the shoreline and, uh, and attack there. Um, and uh, that, that's how he plans on using his, his, uh, his men to the greatest uh, efficiencies. He, um, of course, has massed a number of, of the smaller uh, kind of lake boats that would be necessary to move the men. Um, uh, apparently, the, the first one out when he finally does start the attack is, uh, is a group of musicians that they send out to sing, uh, to, to, to play, you know, patriotic songs as they're going out. And uh, once uh, the batteries from the British side opened up, the musicians kind of, you know, <laughs> peeled off and went back to where they came from. It seems to be around the 1500 mark. Interestingly enough, uh, most of them are not staying in the fort. They're, they're staying out in the commons on the other side of, of the fort, uh, mainly for safety reasons. Uh, being in the fort, the fort's a target, you start dropping artillery there and everyone's running in a panic in every which way, you get them outside of that, you've got them there to organize and you can move them out. Um, there were supposed to not be any ladies present in the fort. Uh, however, uh, there were some of the wives of the soldiers who uh, decided that rather than go to safety or to a safe locale, that they would stick it out. So that there actually were uh, some women and children that, that were still in the fort at that time. Um, Scott, what about the bombardment itself? Uh, did they fire the cannon directly from uh, Fort Niagara, whereabouts? Yeah, they would. Um, they would be uh, firing. You can see that the, there's two uh, two kind of roofed areas, and and those are are actually major artillery points on the top of that fort. Um, they also would have had uh, gunboats coming up the river as well, bombarding it. And um, really, uh, the, the fort, uh, this fort is, is wide open to that sort of assault. I mean, that one, as I say, it's a very old fort, even by their standards at that point, and it's all made out of cut stone and it's substantial. There's actually elements of castle building there, as there are here as well. But uh, this one, uh, I think Fort George, this was the temporary position for what it was going to be. And I think in the long run, they were probably looking at doing a similar thing with this area. But at this point, what we're looking at right now is pretty dead on to what it looked like for them. Interesting. You know, the interesting thing about artillerists, they're, uh, they're well thought of, certainly in the British Army. They're given the blue coats. That's the king's colors to wear and, and whatever, for good reason. There's a lot of math involved here. <laughs> I, I would have been a terrible artillerist, <laughs> but they they could figure out the angles, they could figure out the distances, the drops, the that they you know what they're firing from. So methodically, at the onset of of when that whole big invasion day comes, they are just pounding this, and they're pounding it dead on. They're hitting the barrack buildings, they're sending them up in flames. You know, they're they're just they're just dropping. Or and the only safe places would have been where they had dug out some of these areas uh, where they were storing munitions and whatever. And that's where the women and children were crawling into just to, to get out of, uh, out of harm's way. Um, but that was, uh, of course, this is the advantage when you've got the numbers, you've got that location. And, and uh, of course, everyone probably here is thinking, OK, they're going to definitely be coming in, you know, en masse across the river. And they don't. They're a mile down and, and they start their landing. So not to say there weren't scouts there to, to get the relay back saying this is where they're coming in and they're able to support that to a certain extent. Um, but it, it really, I think, took them by surprise. They had landed in a place where there was a sand embankment that went up about 20 feet to get to the thing. So uh, the British very wisely 
uh, when the artillery stopped, because they stopped firing once their men started, just went to the edge and were firing down at them. And they got, I think, repulsed three times. At one point, Winfield Scott actually gets into a sword duel with one of the, uh, one of the militia, and, and uh, he manages to get away from him before he's stabbed. What was it? it was the very first time in American military history that joint forces got together to uh, do an invasionary attack like that. So you not only had the army, but you had the navy involved as well. You had uh, the art artillerists, you had all various aspects of the, of the American uh, soldiery that were available were, took part in that. So, and it's still to this day taught at West Point as a, uh, as a, uh, a good example of, of how to put something like that together. Of the attack. So, um, so you've got, it's really a three-prong attack is, is what he has planned. And, and what that means is he's going to have um, forces coming basically down the shoreline. Uh, from back up by where I said by Shakespeare, they're, they'll peel off and head down that way. Uh, a large contingent that will go right down the main street of, of what's now Niagara on the lake. And then another farther uh, contingent. The idea is that they're going to try and capture all the British forces. These things are going to link up eventually and they'll have them surrounded and, and capture them. Um, and of course the British are badly outnumbered at this time, but they do manage to kind of hold their own in terms of a of some sort of qualified retreat. They, they, um, there's a, I know there's a, a, a sizable field gun bastions set up by St. Andrew's Church, where it's today, uh, and they were, they're able to kind of slowly move those back as the as the army poses itself and that way it stops them from being able to cut that loop uh, and uh, of course you look at the uh, the British uh, commander who's uh, his name absolutely Vincent. Vincent yeah Vincent starts to look at this and he realizes what's up and he figures the best thing they can do is get out uh, with as little damage as possible so he starts to withdraw the troops but um, there's there's some fascinating stories that come out of that attack uh, in terms of civilians here. You want to talk about bravery. Um, we always seem to be searching, particularly for for a female presence. You know that you just don't hear enough about Mrs. Henry. Unbelievably, the two of them are dodging out of that lighthouse and grabbing wounded British soldiers and hauling them in. You know, under very heavy fire. Uh, an act of courage I, I don't think I would be up to. They certainly were. Uh, and it actually slowed down a bit, slowed the, the, uh, the progress down a bit. They were able to hold them there for a, a bit, which allowed them, the, the British basically, to, to clear out the fort. Not taking the women and children that were here. They were, they were still stuck here. Um, I do know that once the American army had taken over the fort, uh, or what was left of the fort, um, they had to now bivouac, you know, probably close to 7,000 soldiers. And uh, so they were spread out uh, from the interior of, of where the fort had been all the way down to King Street. It's interesting that there was very little follow-up by the Americans to chase the British at that point. Okay. Um, but then, of course, they had been through a battle and um, you can only get your troop to do so much. And so they, they kind of had to wait that part of it out. Now, they did go after them, um, uh, but uh, that's probably a few days after that point because they, when they finally do meet up, it's at Stony Creek. British take them by surprise, and uh, that's really the extent of, of the incursion by the Americans. They're slowly forced to drop back and drop back and drop back. Uh, it, this was this was clearly uh, an attempt to establish a beachhead on on British property, and to slowly use that as a basis for taking over the entire province. See, things were going pretty good for them out west, um, and as they were pushed in from that direction, if they could get them sort of in a vice, they figured they could kind of wrap it all up and then they would have control over most of what's south and southwestern Ontario and where most of the people lived as well. And then, then it just becomes a question of reallocating your troops to where you needed to, to fight the British in the next spot. Um, 
like a lot of plans that didn't really come to fruition, there was all sorts of things that did happen. Stony Creek was a big surprise to them, quite frankly. They were not expecting to be attacked at night. They were totally taken by surprise. Uh, uh, one of the interesting side stories I've heard about Stony Creek is that Vincent, who was the British commander, of course, um, his, uh, he got lost in the middle of the battle. They were right at the base of the escarpment, and his, he's got up in the woods. When he finally shows up the next morning, he's without his hat or sword. Uh, he's on horseback, and he, he like, literally just <laughs> missed the whole thing. How are you dressed today? What what does your uniform signify? Well, thanks for asking, Tony. This is a, this is a British surgeon's uh, uniform, probably considered a dress uniform, um, for the 41st Regiment. Uh, you can see that on the buttons, of course. A single epaulet uh, would indicate rank. Um, in this instance, surgeon really is the rank. It's equivalent to probably a captain. Um, and uh, this would be normal attire when you had to do something a little fussy or whatever. Um, and during times of battle, of course, surgeons are busy doing a variety of other things. Chances of him wearing something like this when they were under fire and whatever, very, very unlikely. The British really had it down by that point that you don't wear your good clothes to a battle, you know. By 1825, Fort George was in ruins, and it remained that way for over 100 years. Its eight-acre site was leased out to citizens who allowed livestock to roam the old fortification. Even the stone powder magazine was occupied by squatters. Then, in 1939, the fort was restored. It was officially opened in June of 1950 and was operated by Niagara Parks until 1969, when it was transferred back to the federal government and eventually, of course, Parks Canada. Today, Fort George is visited by thousands of visitors and window panes once again rattle to the sound of cannons during the many reenactments. We want to thank Scott Finley for these insights into the Battle of Fort George, fought here to defend our homeland 208 years ago. Thanks Scott and Parks Canada. <laughs>